Hold on. It's okay. Hi. Hi. This is Josh Blackman. Uh, I am the president of the Harlan Institute, and today we are honored to be uh, having a moot court session for the Harlan Institute Consoles Virtual Supreme Court Competition. We are going to be having a competition about the case of Zivotofsky v. Kerry. Arguing for the petitioners will be David and Nick from Maryland, and arguing for the respondents will be Apeksha and Brianna for the state of Maryland as well. Uh, each side will get about 20 minutes, and I will be asking questions throughout, and we will decide the case of whether Congress can require the Secretary of State to issue a passport with a place of birth marked as Israel for person born in Jerusalem. So without further ado, uh, David and uh, Nick, as, as petitioners, you have 20 minutes. You may begin whenever you're ready. Yes, you may reserve five minutes. Go ahead. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. The Court of Appeals erred in holding that the recognition power is held solely by the President. The Court of Appeals reached this decision by erroneously interpreting the text of the ratification era history of the Constitution, Article 2, Section 2 specifically. The eight words that give rise to a recognition power in this case are simply, he shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. However, since we are interpreting, since we are extrapolating those eight words to find a broader recognition power, it's important to look at the historical context in which those words were written. And the historical context which the court improperly analyzed is very clear. Under the Articles of the Confederation Scheme, the duty to receive ambassadors from foreign nations lay solely with Congress. However, when the framers were drafting the Constitution, it became clear to them that this was very inconvenient. If Congress wanted to receive an ambassador from the foreign nation, they would have to gavel into session, receive that ambassador, and then adjourn uh, session. And so when Article 2, Section 3 was written, the framers of the Constitution sought only to transfer that power from Congress to the executive who would perpetually be available for that purpose. Um, and in transferring that power, they didn't necessarily seek to enlarge it into a sole power. And the historical sources demonstrate that both the framers of the Constitution who actually wrote Article 2, Section 3, as well as those delegates at ratifying conventions who actually voted to approve the Constitution to think of it that way. We have a quote from Archibald McLean, who is a delegate at the North Carolina Ratifying Convention, and he says that he understands that Article 2, Section 3 is simply a matter of convenience. In addition to that, James Madison, who wrote the Constitution itself, says that it would be highly improper to magnify the function into an important prerogative. On top of that, there are modern legal scholars, for example, Lewis Henkin, a renowned scholar of international law, who understands that the reception of an ambassador or public minister from the foreign nation is a function and not a power itself. Okay. Counselor, very good to start. So if I can ask you a question before we get too far into the merits. Why should the Supreme Court be getting involved in this sort of political dispute? This is a question about very high importance about the Middle East. And depending how the United States Supreme Court rules in this case, it may actually impact our national security. I mean, why shouldn't the Supreme Court simply say we defer to the president on these matters? Well, Your Honor, we absolutely agree that the court should be hesitant in involving itself in what is ultimately a dispute about foreign policy. However, um, I would quote uh, Justice Sotomayor's concurrence in Zivotofsky v. Clinton when the question of standing was raised four years ago. And she um, said that a court may not refuse to adjudicate a, a dispute merely because a decision may have significant political overtones or affect the conduct of this nation's foreign relations. Essentially, this case is about the ability of um, Benjamin Zivotofsky and his parents to vindicate a right that was established by Congress, and that right is to have a passport reflect the place of birth as Israel instead of Jerusalem. And so this court is proper in, in taking this case and allowing um, Benjamin Zivotofsky to vindicate that statutory right. And 
it definitely is necessary to have a nuanced approach to this. Uh, the court should not delve into policy analysis. It should not consider the pros and cons of certain foreign policy decisions, but it is able to make a legal judgment based on the Constitution itself. Very good. If I can ask a question to your, to your co-counselor. Um, sir, let me ask you this question. Is there a recognition power defined anywhere in the text of the Constitution? Uh, no, we don't believe that the recognition power is explicitly defined within the Constitution. Um, we believe that the uh, respondent's argument that the Article 2, Section 3 provides this power is a stretch. and It's a, an incorrect expansion of the language of the Constitution. Uh, we would look at um, the way that foreign policy is dealt with within the Constitution as an indication of how the framers intended um, this to be distributed. Um, and we see in issues of declaring war and raising militia that the Senate and the Congress is always consulted. Um, I have a quote from Abraham uh, Sofair, who is a former legal advisor to the State Department and a U.S. District Court judge. He said that um, the framers' distribution of constitutional power regarding the conduct of American foreign relations was, quote, that Congress was to have the final say in foreign and military affairs, and I believe that the Constitution bears that out. So, if I, so, 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 Nick, if I may ask a follow-up question, um, you mentioned declaring war. You mentioned um, foreign commerce. Isn't this a situation where the Constitution specified a place where Congress has a role? In contrast, Congress is, the Constitution is silent here. Shouldn't we infer from that silence that the framers didn't want to give Congress this overlapping share of power? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that would be the correct interpretation. I think it's clear when you study the historical context that um, the, the framers implied uh, recognition power would be shared in the same respect as the others were. Um, when you look at, for example, Madison considered the, the, the issue of the reception of ambassador uh, of ambassadors a question of necessity. I don't think he, he, he really intended for it to be neglected. I think it was, it was implied throughout that there failure to directly address it has any bearing. Very good. So now a question back for your co-counselor, David. Um, David, let me ask you this question. Um, there's a clause in Article 2, Section 3 that says the president gets to receive ambassadors. In order to receive an ambassador, doesn't the president decide which is the correct versus the not correct representative of a government? Um, isn't that effectively the recognition power? The president does have to make that determination when he when he decides to receive an ambassador, but that doesn't necessarily preclude Congress from being able to make a policy decision on behalf of the people of the United States. So if this, such an analysis could be informed, for example, by the Youngstown versus Sawyer case. And so this, your example is a case where Congress has been silent at the, on the matter, and so the president is in a zone of twilight. Uh, those are Justice Jackson's words. and so. However, the contrast between your scenario and this case is that Congress has spoken on this matter, and Congress has spoken very clearly, which is to say that a passport should say Israel if a um, person requesting a passport wants it to say Israel. So I do believe that in your scenario, the president can make that determination if Congress has not spoken. However, precedent set by the Supreme Court makes it clear that if Congress has spoken one way or the other, the president does have to faithfully execute that law. So, I mean, you mentioned a very important case, Youngstown Chi and Tube Company versus Sawyer. This is the biggest separation of powers case we have, and you mentioned a zone of twilight. Um, but are, is it really at a zone of twilight, or is it the lowest ebb where Congress says doing one thing and the President says no? I mean, is, is, is there even any ambiguity about Congress's intent here? No, I don't believe there is any ambiguity. Uh, in your scenario, Your Honor, the president would be operating in a zone of spylight because um, Congress had not spoken. However, in this case, uh, with the Foreign Relations Authorization Act for 2003, Congress in Section 211A clearly stated that the Secretary of Home Request must make this change to a passport. So, indeed, this is the third part of Justice Jackson's test where the president's power is at its lowest end. And so, the Supreme Court should take that into consideration. 
Very good, Your Honor, uh, Counselor. Whenever you can cite, whenever you can cite Justice Robert Jackson, you are in good shape because he's a very good justice. Um, let me ask a question to Nick, if, if I may. Um, Nick, what about past practice? So going back to the first presidency of President George Washington, um, were there any examples of the recognition power that may impact our decision that we're deciding on today? Um, yeah, in fact, there is. Um, we believe that. Um, a great example of this is in 1994 um, when President Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said going back to the very first presidency, George Washington. We can get to uh, President Clinton in, in a few minutes, if you like. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question there? Do you have any examples from the founding of our country, the very first years, where a president had to make a decision concerning the recognition power? Well, yes, and that, that situation would um, be uh, with the situation in France when uh, the Washington administration determined that it was that they would recognize the new French Republic that had emerged. Um, so in, in this situation, the president does exercise recognition power, but uh, a central theme of our argument is that uh, just because Congress did not have uh, that, that Congress is in action on the matter does not uh, imply that they do not have any power to act mm -hmm. in implication that they agree with the decision. Mm -hmm. so, 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 Council, let me ask you this question, a follow-up, Nick. Um, if President Washington was able to recognize France by himself, wouldn't that suggest that President Obama also can decide to decide where the capital of Israel is by himself? Why? How does that precedent with George Washington impact the decision before the court today? Well, what we're arguing is that in, in the situation with uh, President Washington, Congress did not have any major objective policy. Um, Whereas in this situation with President Obama, Congress has clearly stated um, a contrary position to that of the president. Uh -huh. so, right, that that sort of president doesn't really uh, apply in this situation. Okay, and I'm about to ask a question, but if one of you could just mute your 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 microphone momentarily, there's a lot of feedback, and turn it right back on. I think that'd be good. So I'll ask a question for a second in the interim. So, so Counselor, I, I think you, you, you've made the, the point that this recognition power is not clearly defined in the Constitution. I think you've also um, made the point that there's some historical practice going both ways. Um, but if, if the court is somewhat in doubt, if we don't know which way to go, um, what should be our guiding influence? Should it be text? Should it be the history of the Constitution? Or should it be modern practice where we have two presidents of different political parties who both agree that this would be an encroachment on executive power. Um, either either counselor, how should we how should we address this question? Well your honor I think the proper way to address an ambiguous question like this is to take into account the strong democratic traditions that our country has, which is deferred uh, deference to Congress, which is elected popularly by the people, and who who in most countries this court and the general public assumes has the final say on the matter. So we believe that the text and uh, historical context does support our position, which is that the recognition of power is shared. And we believe that that conception of a shared recognition power is imbued in all of the Constitution, which upholds a check on the executive's power. Um, my co-counsel before mentioned that in every other case, whether it is declaring war or joining the United States as a party to a treaty, the Senate, which is part of the Congress, has a say. So that is the question when examining a shared uh, power discussion. Okay, very good. Actually, counsel, your time is just about up, so unless you have any closing remarks, anything we have a minute left. Um, I would just very quickly go over the uh, idea that the court doesn't necessarily need to answer the recognition power to resolve this case. Uh, we've identified three uh, ways that the court can sustain uh, this formulation of authorization. And the first is that this is a proper exercise of the necessary and proper clause. Um, there is a dispute that Congress has the authority to authorize the distribution of passports, and so there should not be a dispute over Congress's ability to regulate the content of those passports. Um, secondly, the foreign commerce power is implicated in this case. Um, Congress has the power to regulate the instrument that American citizens use to move across borders, which is in this case a passport, and so we believe that the court can sustain 
uh, this act, which it has an obligation to do it, then find a rationale for upholding. And we will reserve the rest of our time. Okay, Councillor, you, you petitioner has five minutes remaining. I'll ask that you please mute your microphone. Uh, and we will now turn the camera over to the respondents, which is going to be Brianna and Apeksha. You have 20 minutes. Um, please unmute your microphone, and you may begin whenever you're ready. Um, sure. what? Sure. Well, what's happening? Go ahead. Oh, whenever you're ready, Council, you may begin. Sorry. Okay. That's Brianna Branch, okay. on behalf of the respondent, if it please the court. I will be focusing on the recognition power and its exclusiveness to the president with no congressional limitations. First, I would like to start off with the definition of the recognition power as defined by the Restatement of Foreign Relations, Section 94. This allows a, well, a representative to declare a state as a state or to recognize a government. We believe that the scope of this power could extend to recognizing a nation as a country or, in this case, as Israel, Jerusalem as a part of Israel. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution gives the President the power to receive foreign ambassadors. We say that this ties into giving the President recognition power because allowing him to receive foreign ambassadors decides, lets him decide on how foreign relations will carry on with the nation that we are receiving ambassadors from. It gives him the opportunity to say how things will go with that nation and if he decides not to receive them then Congress should have no dealings with them or make any laws such as the Foreign Relations Authorization Act to contradict his decision. It was also brought up that the framers of the Constitution didn't believe that the power should be rested fully in the president and in fact there is a quote from one of our framers Alexander Hamilton in which he said Congress should not be the center of diplomatic relations and that they were simply there to enforce the president's diplomatic decisions which enforces the idea that the framers did think that the power did belong with the president and Congress was only there there to back up his decision, say, but it's after, com completely after the president has made his decision and his choice, and they're just there to enforce it. There was also another quote coming from Thomas Jefferson, another one of our framers, who said that the transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether, showing that, once again, the original intent of the framers was to give the president the recognition power. Congress was to have no role playing in that power. Um, again, we bringing up Archibald McLean of, of the North Carolina Ratifying Convention. He and oh, sorry, he showed that the job is the president's because if it was given to Congress, there would be public inconveniences because they would have to convene every time that a foreign ambassador would come into play, or they wanted to recognize a foreign nation which would cause several problems. It would take forever because of how many of them there are and altogether it would just be a messy process. So it was given to the president as a role of convenience. Okay, very good. Uh, so, so, Councillor, thank you for your introductory statement. One, one slight correction, Thomas Jefferson was in France during the Constitutional Convention, so he wasn't actually a framer. But, but he was very, very important. I think he is a very strong influence in our founding documents. So before I get too far into this, I can ask a question to your colleague, Apeksha. Um, we have the Constitution, right? And in many respects, Congress does share power over foreign affairs, as David and Nick mentioned, declaration of war, foreign commerce, right? These are things where Congress has a very clear role. Would it be so striking to think that Congress also has a role in this matter? There are a couple of other places where Congress does not play a role, and um, the, the framers, like Alexander yeah. Hamilton and James Madison, also made it very clear that they wanted the power of the um, recognition to stay in the executive, 
um, in the exam they have French only, so I feel like that, that should, should cover, cover for why why is only in the hands of the executive and Congress does not have their seal of approval until after the president has recognized a country. But, but Petra, let me ask you a follow-up question, please. What clause of the Constitution gives the president the power to recognize foreign nations? Um, Article 2, Section 3 implies that. It does not directly state it, but it implies that the president has um, recognition power. So what, what, but, but why do we make that implication? You say that it applies it. What, why should the Supreme Court make that implication in this case? Um, George Washington had set a precedent when he first came into office of, of conducting foreign affairs that way, and so that has that has, has played a role into what we have now. And also, as I previously mentioned, the framers framers that the act of the executive is binding, and Congress cannot they can express their discontent, but that's it. Right. So if I can ask Brianna, your, your co-counsel. What do we make of the fact that we have a statute, right? We usually have in this country shared powers, and Congress said something, and the president signed into law, right? If this was such an unconstitutional law, why didn't President Bush simply veto it, right? What do we make of the fact that the president signed this into law? Um, ooh. Let's see. Um, I believe that the president signed this into law without veto because if Congress actually had the, the, I guess the ability to work together and unite behind something, the president felt that if he did veto it, it would only cause problems. It would just, you know, his veto could be overpowered by the two-thirds um, vote against him in Congress. If they could all stand behind this law now, him vetoing it wouldn't really change anything. Very good. So if I can ask a follow-up question, do you remember anything about a signing statement being issued in relationship to this law? Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. What, what was the nature of that signing statement? We're talking about the signing statement from George Bush. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, in this signing statement, George Bush, he did sign the law that he expressed his discontent and that he felt that it was, an unconstitu it was unconstitutional and it was an encroachment on power. He basically said it impermissibly interfered with the president's constitutional authority to conduct the nation's foreign affairs and supervise unitary executive what do we make of this signing statement? Does this have any legal significance? If this was such an unconstitutional law, why couldn't the president simply veto it? There were other provisions, um, the law about George, that George Bush signed? Yes, ma'am. There were other provisions and other parts that he felt that if he didn't sign it, it would cause more harm than benefit. So, um, Regardless of this section 214D, he signed it anyway. Oh, I know. I'm sure that's true. But as far as a court, it's law. And um, your colleagues mentioned a very important case called Youngstown Cheat and Tube Company versus Sawyer. And as mm -hmm. I said, this case involves a situation where when we have an executive power question and Congress says, no, you can't do that, and the president says, I'm going to do it anyway. We're in this weird zone of twilight or something where we don't know the scope of powers. Um, how would you respond to the uh, Justice Jackson's opinion in Youngstown? Um, we believe that that was, although there are some things that the executive obviously can't do because it's written in the Constitution, but as, as time has gone further and further, um, there's implied powers. Like, for example, when the Constitution was first written, there were no, like, nuclear nuclear codes or drones, but today the president is still expected to use those and um, use them well. So as, as we go on, the role of government gets bigger, and so there's different circumstances that come into question. Okay, very good. I'll ask a, co a question to your colleague, Bri uh, Brianna. Um, what's the role of precedent, right? How do we balance historical practice, like history and founding era thought, which your colleagues mentioned, right, what, James, what, what Hamilton wrote and others, and we have all this precedent where people like George Washington and Bill Clinton haven't exactly maybe followed that. How do we, 
How do we negotiate this tension between history and practice of precedents, Brianna? Um, I'm not really sure how you find a direct balance. You'd maybe have to take into into consideration maybe the precedents and the history to try and come up with you know a better option than the two because focusing on history isn't always going to get you where you need to go and focusing on precedent precedence is not always going to get you where you need to go. You might have to combine the two and come up with a compromise between the two to come up with their decision. So how is a court supposed to do that? How are we as judges supposed to balance precedent and history? What, I mean, we're, we're just judges. What are we supposed to do here? Guess when you take the two looking over, both of them, I guess you make your best decision on how you feel. Well, is it about feeling? Are we, are we, is it a touchy feely game? I mean, we're, yeah. <laughs> these are this is this, this is a high stake. Hey, this is not something that we can decide lightly, is it? No, I get you take a lot take a lot into consideration. Um, maybe do a lot of research. Kind of combine precedents and historical background into one thing that you can make a decision for on this case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me ask a question back to Apexha for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your colleagues' closing arguments, they, they, they discuss the Foreign Commerce Clause, and I think you'd agree that Congress has power over foreign commerce. Is, you agree with that? Yes. Isn't a passport an article of foreign commerce? Yes, it is, but um, the power that was written the, in the Constitution, section Article 2, Section 3, it says that um, the president is given the power to recognize, um, not recognize, to receive ambassadors and foreign ministers. So I feel like that should trump that because we've got lots and lots of accounts from um, framers at that time who believe the same thing, who believe that um, there that um, if we did not give this power to the president that it would be neglected. And so that should be a very promising reason to believe that the power should go to the president. So let me ask you this follow-up question though, right? Um, is this really even a case of recognition? Does stamping a passport with Israel as opposed to Jerusalem signify that the United States is recognizing anything? Yes, it does because when you're when you um, are putting that Jerusalem is in Israel, you are you are saying that Jerusalem belongs to Israel, which is why you are putting it as the birth of country. So I feel like that should re equate to recognition. But does it have to? I mean, we don't have the United States doesn't have an embassy in Israel. Our State Department doesn't say. Well, all we're saying is that on an individual passport of a little, I don't know, he's about 13 years old now, but of, a, of a poor, he, he was a little boy before. Now he's a little bit older, right? All we're saying is in this one boy's passport, we're not announcing this to the world. It's on a private passport, right? Why is this even an act of recognition? Because more than that, it is it is taking it is contradicting the president's wish to not. Say to um, not say that <coughs> Jerusalem belongs to Israel. It's not about just a passport or a person or a little boy's birth country. It's more about the president's wish and his power, which this would um, be, un which is why this would be unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Chris, let me ask a question to Brianna. Um, you know, a lot of the writing in your discussion, some things you've mentioned, have highlighted the fact this is a very important national security issue. And like, you know, if the court rules one way or the other, people can actually get hurt. Um, what role should national security play in our decision? For example, if the court finds that this violates the separation of powers, should it even matter that this will impact our national security? Or how do we how do we balance that? Um. Balancing our national security. Ooh, that's tough. Okay, so if the court does decide that this is a violation of the separation of powers and they allow Congress to have a role in the recognition power, this would like you know give them the power to declare Jerusalem as a part of Israel. National security it could uh, be, I guess, inflicted or 
and um, it, we'd have troubles with it because there are a lot of people, of ethnicities, religions who would love to have control over Jerusalem and the United States could face to gain more enemies from the decision of making this a separation of powers, which is really not something we need, you know, maybe adding more terrorist attacks, um, attacks on the U.S. again, all because one all that, All that can be true. I, I don't disagree with anything you said, but how is that something for courts to consider? Our job, as John Marshall said 200 years ago, is to expound a constitution, a document. I mean, it's very small. I hold it, I hold it in my hands, right? It's right up here. Like, but what, why should we be considering these national affairs matters? Is that, is that, is that even in our competence to even think about? I feel that it should be, because if this court decision does, if this court decision is made and it um, reacts with the national security of um, a lot of Americans, the U.S. itself could be in a lot of trouble. It would be, it could be something that we could totally avoid and not have to work with or deal with. Okay, counselors, you have a few more minutes left if you want to go through your closing statements or anything else like that, you're welcome to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to um, talk more on when you said that um, the passports were a form of foreign commerce. I feel that um, just because Congress does have power over foreign commerce, but if we're saying that the, we believe that the pres um, president has recognition power, if the president does not recognize a foreign nation, it should be thought that Congress should not have any foreign commerce dealings with that nation. So if, since the president is refusing to recognize Jerusalem as a part of Israel, the Congress exercising their power over foreign commerce and like representation of the passport should be irrelevant. It doesn't matter because we do not recognize the place. E even though it's simply a stamp and a passport, should it matter? That's all, all we're talking about. We're, talk we're talking about a stamp and a passport. <laughs> it is just a stamp and a passport, but it represents more. It's a symbol. It's not directly, it's not just, you know, stamping here, it's done. It's a symbol that the U.S. is now seeing Jerusalem as a part of Israel which we don't at the moment. So it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Councilor, anything else you'd like to add? Um, yes. In regards to the signing statement made by George Bush on the 2003 uh, Foreign Relations Authorization Act, the point, the fact that there were questions raised is enough to, like, raise, to show that it was not always um, just all the presidents believing that and doing whatever they wished. So it proves that questions regarding the legality of this policy were raised, unlike the old Foreign Relations Authorization Act. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, you're just out of time. Unless you have anything else to add, I I'll thank you very much. And uh, please put your microphone on mute, and we will go back to David and Nick for five minutes rebuttal. Thank you very much, girls. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Counselor David and Nick, you have five minutes of rebuttal time. You begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to cover a couple of things that our, uh, the respondents mentioned during their oral arguments. Um, the first thing is we, we do have some issue with the way they interpreted Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution. Um, in Federalist 69, uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, called the, this power um, a matter of dignity rather than of authority, and he, he seemed to indicate that uh, it was uh, it, 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 something that would have very little consequence in the administration of government. In other words, he didn't intend for it to be to have far-reaching yeah, uh, uh, far-reaching implications. Um, and we we've we stated before that we, we believe it's very clear. Uh, constitutional scholars and framers alike have have been very clear that Congress was to have the final say in foreign and military affairs. Um, at the New York Rad convention, uh, Hamilton said that the Senate was, quote, to work together with the President to manage all our concerns with foreign nations. So we believe that um, it is clear that the framers' intent um, was for issues of foreign affairs to be shared between the two branches, and we believe that, that Article 2, Section 3 is an exception uh, made for convenience because the President or the, the Congress cannot convene every time we want to uh, recognize, uh, accept an ambassador. Instead, it's, so, so it's an exception made for convenience. It's not, it does not set a larger precedent for 
how we should recognize foreign nations. Um, furthermore, our, our, uh, the respondents tried to argue that um, the court should consider the political implications and the foreign policy implications of a decision in favor of Zivotofsky in this case. Uh, we believe that the court, it's not the court's um, place to be making, uh, to be answering political questions. Uh, instead, they should be looking strictly at the constitutionality of it and how uh, the framers of the Constitution intended for the, uh, the, uh, the recognition power to be divided between the executive and the legislative branches. So it's, it's a constitutional question that, they should be, that, that should be addressed, not a political one. And the political implications should be, um, for all intents and purposes, irrelevant in this arena. Um, and last, they did mention the uh, 2003 Foreign Relations Act, uh, Foreign Relations Authorization Act, in which uh, President Bush uh, raised some concerns over um, Congress's uh, objection to uh, Congress's interference in the uh, recognition of Israel, uh, Jerusalem as a part of Israel. But we'd just like to point to the uh, a similar uh, incident in 1994 uh, when the Congress for, Congress's Foreign Relations Authorization Act contradicted uh, President Bill Clinton's One China policy, where Taiwan was considered uh, part of China. Uh, in, in the Foreign Relations Act, uh, Congress uh, required that, uh, that that Taiwan should be recognized as Taiwan and not as China on birth certificates if it's requested. Uh, and in his signing statement, President Clinton objected to, to the Constitution, or raised questions about the constitutionality of four parts of the Act. However, he did not raise any questions over um, Congress's um, objection to his One China policy. Instead, his State Department revised their policy accordingly so as to, uh, to comply with Congress's uh, prerogative. prerogative. Uh, in, in, that, in that sense, um, President Clinton set a precedent of recognizing con con uh, congressional privacy in the matter of uh, recognition power. Uh, and we believe that that example is a clear, clear example of, um, of the power of recognition being shared and uh, it's an example of how the president should accept input from Congress on issues uh, like the recognition power. Uh, and with that, uh, we reserve the rest of our time. Councilor, anything else to add? Um, yes, I would make one final comment, which is that in the respondents' oral argument, they talked about how Article 2, Section 3 um, trumps the Foreign Commerce Clause, uh, which allows Congress to regulate the movement of Americans through borders. However, our position is that Article 2, Section 3 does not trump the Foreign Commerce Clause in this case. And it's for the reason that the Foreign Commerce Clause is clear that Congress has the authority to regulate uh, the movement of persons if it affects foreign commerce. However, Article 2, Section 3 is much more unclear. All it says is that the president can receive an ambassador. It doesn't even touch the idea of recognition. And so the court should defer to the more, to the clearer uh, part of the Constitution, which in this case is the Foreign Commerce Clause, which we do believe authorizes the distribution of passports and the regulation of the content of those passports. All right, and your time is just up. So uh, I'd like to uh, adjourn court and thank both the petitioners. This is David and Nick, and the respondents, Apeksha and Brianna, for a very lively, a very enriching and lively discussion. Um, we are proud of all of you. You've done a wonderful job. We had a record number of submissions this year. We had a very difficult time. Uh, choosing the teams to advance. We're very grateful you took the time to do this after busy schedules. Uh, we will be in touch in the next day or so with, your, with, with you to decide who will advance the next round. And we are thankful for all of you on behalf of uh, my colleague Julie Silverbrook at Consource. Um, thank you very much. And have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.